Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the invitation to come and, uh, and be here today. Um, if I can get this to move forward. There, I have nothing to really disclose uh, in relation to this talk. And here are my learning objectives, uh, really, which is to talk about uh, what I think is going to be uh, a paradigm shift in how we treat women with gynecological cancers with radiation treatment. I'm going to focus most of my talk on cervical cancer, but what I'm going to say also applies to other tumor types, um, including uh, endometrial cancer that may be unresectable or inoperable, recurrent endometrial cancer, vaginal tumors. The same principles apply across the board. Uh, and we're going to talk about how this field is evolving, um, some of the uh, indications for this kind of treatment, uh, and some of the challenges associated with making this uh, new approach and new treatment technique available to all of our patients uh, in Canada. So this is cervical cancer. Uh, we don't um, talk as much about cervical cancer in our community as we do about things like ovarian cancer, which are much more common, affect a lot more women. But globally, this disease is huge, and there are about half a million women every year diagnosed in the world with cervical cancer. About 250,000 women globally die of this disease. Um, and we continue to see this in Canada, and particularly in some regions of the country, we see a lot of cervical cancer still. We're part of this global community. There's a lot of immigration to our country, so we continually see women, um, some of whom are, are, are native to Canada and are diagnosed with the disease, but we continue to see a lot of women who migrate to Canada from parts of the world where this disease is endemic. And they often present with disease like this. This is one of my patients from not that long ago which is not resectable, not treatable with, with surgery, but is potentially curable with radiation treatment. And certainly the best chance of curing these, this disease in these women is right up front. If they fail after primary treatment, uh, it's a death sentence for them, whether they fail locally in the pelvis or alone or whether they fail with uh, metastatic disease because we have really no good salvage treatment for these women. So the focus of our efforts needs to be on intensifying treatment up front. Now, um, there's a lot of discussion in our community, quite rightly so, about HPV and the role of HPV in preventing cervical cancer. And, and I think that's a very, very, very important conversation and something that we need to keep pushing. But we also need to recognize that there's a large population of women that despite HPV vaccination and early detection will continue to be diagnosed with this disease. So Helen was insistent that I have audience participation questions embedded in this. So I have three over the course of the next few minutes. And this is the first question. So I think if you can, you get out your phones and this should work somehow for you. According to the Canadian Cancer uh, Statistics 2000 and 2016, how much will HPV vaccination in Canada reduce the national cervical cancer burden over the next 20 years? And there are your choices uh, on the screen. That's fine, we can go back. So it's actually number one, less than 10%. So the, num the average annual uh, number of cases per year diagnosed over the next 20 years will be in the range of eight to 9%. Um, so that, and, and we've just gone through a similar modeling exercise using global data um, and have come up with a very similar number of about seven and a half percent over the next 20 years. And it's because of this very long lead time for cervical cancer and the fact that anything that we do today in terms of vaccination, the effects of that aren't seen for many years down the road. And the World Health Organization has acknowledged this and recognized the fact that we really need to be investing not only in early detection and screening um, and vaccination, but we also need to invest in treatment as well. Here are some of our results for treatment from the Princess Margaret. This is a cohort of about 300 patients over many years. And this is overall survival. Uh, you can see two lines there. The top line is radiation plus cisplatin. The bottom line is radiation alone. And I think probably most of us would agree that the biggest um, um, advance in the treatment of locally advanced cervical cancer in the last 20 years has been the addition of concurrent cisplatin. And these results are very similar to what the randomized trials showed, 7 or 8% improvement in survival at five years and beyond. Um, but you look there and you say, well, you know, the benefit of radiation treatment, which is uh, sort of from the zero to the, the bottom of those curves, hasn't really changed. We haven't really done anything over the past 50 years to improve how we're delivering radiation treatment to these patients, which is the main curative modality. And within that space, we have external beam and brachytherapy. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about mostly today is brachytherapy and its influence on uh, overall cure rates. 
And what does brachytherapy mean? So brachytherapy um, just means um, therapy at a very short distance. And in the context of uh, cancer treatment, it means putting the radiation source right into the center of the tumor so that it's in very close proximity to the tumor. It's the most conformal and targeted form of radiation treatment that we have. It's far better than any of the high technology approaches that we use in the clinic today, including things like proton therapy. It is extremely precise. It's interesting in the context of this discussion that it was developed by a woman, Marie Curie, um, uh, who actually developed radium, and radium was the first uh, radioactive source that was used for brachytherapy. She's also, it's also quite interesting, and I didn't know this uh, on the side, she uh, is one of only four people in uh, history to win a Nobel Prize twice. She's only uh, one of two people to win a Nobel Prize in two different areas of science. She won it in physics and chemistry uh, on two different occasions for the work that she did. So very impressive. So this is just to make the point that brachytherapy is essential. This is some work that Kathy Hahn did looking at the SEER database in the US. Kathy's at our place. She's a radiation oncologist. This was when she was doing her master's at Harvard. And it really shows that on a population basis, if you don't have brachytherapy involved in the treatment of these women, they do worse. And there's a lot of push in the US and elsewhere to replace brachytherapy with other forms of external beam radiation treatment. And I think that's a big mistake that we really need to be careful about uh, moving forward with because it threatens the outcome of these women. Uh, brachytherapy um, has been done in the same way for many, many years. And this is what many of us learned when we were training and in school. Uh, it's a 2D approach, one size fits all. There's an intratandem, uh, intrauterine tandem that's inserted along with colpostats at the top of the vagina. Uh, and the dose prescription is identical for every woman. It doesn't matter based on her anatomy, the tumor shape, size, or configuration, and where the normal tissues are. Uh, you end up treating a distribution or a volume of tissue in the pink there on the right that looks like a pear. And that's been the way we've been doing things. And it works really well in some circumstances but it is associated with poor local control of the tumor in women who have large cancers, and it's associated with really high toxicity rates in women who have smaller cancers in general. And you know, in our populations of women who were treated in this way over the years, we would have up to a 15% serious morbidity rate. So and that, by that I mean rectal bleeding, fistulas, bowel and bladder issues in general that um, are, are really unacceptable in the context of day-to-day -day practice. And those two things, improved tumor control in the pelvis and a reduction in side effects are the real motivation for moving forward with a new way of doing this based on new technology and new approaches that we now have available in the clinic. And, um, the reason that uh, the 2D approach was um, in place for so long is that we didn't really have a way of better analyzing what we were doing in women. We had x-rays. X-rays don't show us the tumor. They don't show us the normal tissues. Ultrasound helps a little bit. CT is not very good. MR has emerged as the gold standard for how we visualize these structures in the pelvis. And this just illustrates that. This is, uh, from the left, something called a cone beam CT, which is the kind of CT we all have on our radiation treatment units. Every program, every department in the country has a cone beam CT unit on all of their radiation treatment units, external beam treatment units. And in the middle is sort of a more conventional diagnostic CT, and on the right is an MR. And as you move from left to right, you know, it's pretty hard on the left to see anything in the pelvis that you could say is tumor. How would you go about targeting that in any meaningful way? You can't see anything. Even on the right there, there seems to be a mass in the center there, um, uh, you know, that is in some way probably representative of tumor, but not very uh, clearly so. And on the, in the MR on the right, you see this tiny little nub, and I'm sorry I can't point very effectively here, but you see this tiny little nub in the center there with a brighter area. She actually had a very, very small tumor uh, that you would not have appreciated on either of those other two images and that you can only see in any meaningful way on MR. So as you move left to right, you get much greater confidence in what you're doing in terms of targeting these tumors in the pelvis. And it's allowed us now to understand a lot more about the dynamics and how things change during treatment and how um, these cancers regress and change in configuration. So on the left is a sagittal MR of one of my patients with a big posterior lip tumor. Um, and this is after external beam treatment on the right now where she has just a small area of high signal on a T2 image remaining in the posterior lip. MR now allows us that opportunity to really adapt treatment and target these things in a much more uh, precise way. 
And the concept of using MR-guided brachytherapy um, for cervical cancer originated um, largely in Europe uh, probably 10 years ago. Um, and it was driven by, as I said, this idea to improve tumor control in the pelvis and reduce side effects for women. And the European community has really been remarkable in that they've moved this field forward in a number of ways, but largely by defining a path that allows the rest of the world to follow along. They've actually uh, done a lot of work to define how we should be imaging these patients using MR, and they've actually done a lot of work defining our radiation planning objectives so that we know um, how we actually target uh, these tumors, what doses are acceptable to the, or what doses we should be targeting to deliver to the primary tumor, and what doses we should be trying to uh, deliver to the normal tissues in the area of that primary tumor, so rectum, sigmoid, and bladder. And this is just some of the dose constraints and the structure that, that they've, um, they've put in place. They've also acknowledged the fact that this tumor shrinking over time is something that we don't know how to deal with. If you start with a tumor that's five centimeters and at the end of external beam it's four centimeters or two centimeters, what do you do with that intervening space that's left behind? Can we ignore that? Does it still contain cancer cells? How do we incorporate that into our treatment plan? And they've uh, acknowledged this by this sort of volume that's in indicated in green there, which uh, really represents something called an intermediate risk CTV um, versus the high risk CTV at the time of uh, brachytherapy and the fact that we need to consider both in our treatment planning going forward. So this is one of my patients. Again, uh, this is a, a patient who had a T2 cervical cancer. Uh, this is MR imaging. This is a fairly standard treatment plan with a tandem and what we use now, a ring in the upper vagina. The, um, that red shaded area is, is the high-risk CTV or the tumor that's present at the time of brachytherapy. The green area is the size of the tumor at diagnosis. And you can see that um, the, the red line, uh, that pear-shaped line, is a sort of fairly conventional treatment volume that we would have had in the 2D era. Um, and you can see that we're missing this tumor. We're missing, uh, on the left side, posterolaterally, there's a tongue of tumor that comes back in that upper left image that we're missing, um, and we're missing other areas as well. So this patient um, would have been undertreated with this kind of approach had we not had... Um, this kind of imaging. And, and, and it just is to make the point that MR by itself doesn't help in terms of improving outcomes. MR gives us a picture and the vision uh, to understand what's going on, but doesn't actually improve things for us. It allows us to see how poorly we're doing for some of these women, and it changes the paradigm of how we think. So this is the dosimetry. The high-risk CTV is the tumor. Uh, the target is on the right there. That's what we're aiming for. So you can see we're underdosing the tumor in red there at the top, uh, and we're way overdosing the bladder. Uh, so we would expect, we would predict that this woman would be at higher risk than necessary of having a recurrence in the pelvis and at the same time also having bladder toxicity. Um, the change, what, makes, uh, what, what improves outcomes for us is also allowing us to adapt the treatment plan based on those MR images. And that means we have to have more degrees of freedom. And that means putting needles in, not just a tandem in the uterus and a, and a ring or culpostats in the upper vagina. So the approach now that's emerging is that we actually add a number of interstitial needles into the parametrial tissues and elsewhere in a very targeted manner and use those to distribute the dose in a more uh, controlled manner based on the MR images. And this is an example, this is the same patient now with needles and, and you can see that it's slightly different cuts, but that red shaded area is entirely being covered by the prescription isodose. Um, and we're actually managing to keep the dose off adjacent normal tissues like the bladder and the rectum. And that's, this is now the same uh, dosimetry looking at in, in the middle column there with the needles. It shows that we've now moved this patient from a, a space where she was getting inadequate treatment to a space where we believe she's getting quite good treatment with a high likelihood of uh, disease control and um, long-term survival without toxicity. There are a number of studies that have been published in the past five years looking at this, largely from the radiation treatment community in Europe. The biggest two are at the bottom. Uh, the EMBRACE study accrued over 1,300 patients in a prospective randomized uh, manner. 
um, or not pros a prospective registration uh, manner. There's a second EMBRACE study that's accruing now, which really represents best practice MR-guided brachytherapy. But the evidence is accumulating that this actually does what we think it's going to do, which is improve local control, probably improve survival, and reduce side effects. And in Ontario, we went through a consensus building exercise uh, a couple of years ago where we brought people together, brought in people from the European community and looked at all this literature and synthesized um, uh, these outcomes in a way uh, that we think are actually relatively conservative uh, in terms of what to expect. And it kind of gives you an idea that in both low risk and high risk patients, we think we're going to see improvements in pelvic control that probably will translate to improvements in survival and a significant reduction in toxicity, uh, which is, I think, um, really important. The big question, I think, is whether or not there should be a phase three randomized trial of this. And in my opinion, and others may argue with me about this, we've already gone beyond that. I don't think at this point, based on what we know about this technique, that there's equipoise any longer in the radiation treatment community globally around whether or not this is uh, a better treatment or not. And that really stems from the fact that there are such strong correlations between radiation dose and outcome in this disease and in almost every disease that we treat. We know that if we can treat the tumor in a, in a, in a controlled manner to a higher dose, the patient's likely going to do better. And we know that if we can reduce the dose to those normal tissues, we're going to reduce the risk of side effects and patients are going to do better. And what's emerging from all the data that I just showed you are these very, very nice dose-response relationships for tumor control and for normal tissue toxicity. So that's primary tumor control on the top with confidence intervals on it as you increase the dose to the primary tumor along the x-axis. And you see that you know, at, with the doses that we're talking about, there's a 90% probability of tumor control in the pelvis. So I don't think we're going to see a randomized trial of this. I think we're going to see more data emerging from these phase, these registration studies, prospective registration studies, but I don't think we'll actually get um, to a, a position where we're, we're seeing a randomized study. Um, having said that, and based on that actually, um, we've actually, Jen Croak, who was again one of the radiation oncologists at our place a few years ago, did a project looking at quality of care indicators for women receiving uh, radiotherapy for locally advanced cervical cancer in the Canadian community. She polled a number of radiation oncologists, in fact, most of the community, and asked them what they thought uh, about standard of care today and aspirationally what we would be doing five, 10 years down the road. And you can see what people believe. This is the radiation oncology community actually believes that this will be standard of care five years from now. Um, that we will be um, doing MR-guided brachytherapy to treat locally advanced cervical cancer, um, that we use needles when appropriate, and that there'll be an MR before every uh, insertion and every treatment plan, and that MR imaging will be used to optimize that plan. So this is where we're going, I think. I think that we'll have more supportive information to drive this, but this is the direction that we will be uh, heading across Canada. So question number two. How is cervical cancer brachytherapy currently being uh, done uh, in your practice environment? And I, and I would say that's pretty representative of my impression of what's happening across the country. There, the yellow bar has been slowly increasing as we talk to people. There's a lot of focus on building capacity for this new treatment in all provinces. There, right now, it's a bit patchy. There are pockets of activity. There's no harmonized or consolidated approach to how this is happening, but it's growing over time, and there's a lot of awareness and enthusiasm for trying to move this forward in a consolidated way. The red bar, I think most people are probably not doing 2D anymore. They're probably doing CT-guided brachytherapy, which has some of the benefits of MR, but not all of the benefits. It's really hard to use interstitial needles with CT guidance because you can't see anything on CT uh, as, I was, uh, as I was talking about before. So really, it's about how we move forward and make this a treatment, harmonize this practice, and make it accessible for everyone uh, across the country. And one of the barriers to this is the cost. So I would argue that it's much more effective. This is the way to go. It's beneficial for patients. But the cost of doing this at many levels is much higher. And can we afford to do this for every patient with cervical cancer across the country? 
So we actually um, have participated or been part of a cost effectiveness analysis that was done through Cancer Care Ontario, working with uh, the St. Michael's group and, and the health economy group uh, at St. Michael's. And this was a really uh, interesting exercise. The outcome synthesis piece that I showed you earlier was done as part of this cost effectiveness analysis. Um, and I'm not gonna go through the details of, of it, but I will show you um, the results of it. And this is a comparison of MR-guided brachytherapy versus 2D or CT-guided brachytherapy. This is something called a cost-effectiveness plane, increasing effectiveness to the right, increasing cost as you go up. You don't wanna be to the left of that line because that implies whatever you're doing is less effective than what you were doing before. And most treatments are new interventions, new drug treatments, whatever these days, end up being in the right upper quadrant there where they improve outcomes for women but, or for people in general, but you have to pay something in order to see that. And we were very, very surprised when this was done, and, and this was done in an, in an unbiased manner by the folks at St. Mike's. It's almost unheard of to find something that falls in the right lower quadrant there where it both improves outcome and saves money. And I should say at this point that the analysis was done not from the perspective of an individual radiation oncology program. It was done from the perspective of the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, which is the public payer in Ontario. So it includes all of the costs of doing this treatment, and, uh, as well as the, um, uh, the costs of treating recurrences and the costs of managing the toxicities of treatment from their perspective. So outside the sphere of radiation medicine or a radiation oncology program. And the reason that it ends up saving money is that you end up reducing the recurrences that are managed down the road and you end up reducing uh, the number of side effects from the Ministry of Health's perspective. And you can see that there's not much difference there between CT uh, or, or uh, 2D brachytherapy. This looks at it in a different way now. This is now um, um, something called a probabilistic sensitivity analysis. So it executes that um, uh, model a thousand times and it randomly varies all the assumptions in the model in a random manner. So you get all this, these little dots which are individual executions of the model and you get this family of dots that really gives you an idea of how sensitive the model is to changes in some of the assumptions. And you can see that no matter really what you do, you stay in that right lower quadrant there suggesting that it does in fact improve outcome um, um, and, and reduce costs and is relatively insensitive to some of the assumptions. This is the same thing now for high and low risk patients. The high risk patients, which are basically the bulkier tumors, T2B and above are on the right, uh, and you can see the same kind of picture. If you shift to low risk patients, the whole thing kind of moves upward a little bit, uh, implying that there's less benefit, that it may be less cost effective in that population of, of women. But the line that I've drawn there, that sort of diagonal line, is what society would normally accept as um, uh, an appropriate willingness to pay, which is $50,000 per quality adjusted life year. And there's, this is commonly used in many of these cost effectiveness analyses to evaluate whether it's worth investing in. And you can see that it always lies, even in low risk patients, to the right of that line, which suggests that it remains a cost effective treatment even in that population. This is the last, uh, one of the last slides I just wanna show. This is a different kind of analysis now. This is something, or sensitivity analysis. It's something called the deterministic sensitivity analysis. And instead of varying all the assumptions randomly, it varies one of the assumptions at a time and looks to see which ones have the greatest influence uh, on, on the results of this. And the biggest one is that pink bar at the top there, which is actually the cost of treating recurrences uh, of, of cervical cancer if the treatment fails. And it's quite big because in Ontario, the cost of bevacizumab is, is, um, is funded. It's, it's, it's publicly available. So many patients with a recurrence, barring contraindications, will get bevacizumab and that's really, really expensive. So that's driving a part of this cost effectiveness. So we took that out of the model and said, what happens if we get rid of bevacizumab because that's the biggest driver of cost? And this is then looking at that without bevacizumab in the model. It shifts, and this is the whole population again, it shifts that family of, of um, dots upwards so that we end up having to pay a little more to achieve this improvement in quality adjusted life years even without Bev, but um, it's still well to the right of that willingness to pay line of $50,000 per quality adjusted life years. So again, very supportive of the fact that this is something that's quite valuable. So to me, um, and I think most of our community, this is the, 
the, the, the paradigm changing treatment that we're looking at going forward, that it improves um, tumor control um, in the pelvis um, and reduces um, side effects and, and reduces cost, actually. Um, it's rapidly becoming the standard of care um, in cervical cancer and I think other GYN cancers as well. And the big challenge for us now is how do we make this available? If this is really the way forward, how do we make this available to everyone? Because it's not right now. And I think that is really kind of where we need to be. And there are a number of activities across the country and in various provincial jurisdictions to help that happen. Uh, here is some of the challenges that we need to face. I think there, this is a real paradigm shift for the treatment team, not just radiation oncology, but the whole radiation treatment team and the whole GYN oncology team, in fact, because there's a lot of intersection here with the other disciplines. Um, we've actually put a lot of effort into learning how to do this and built peer review networks so that we're all looking at each other's work and each other's treatment plans and commenting on it so that we can actually um, move forward in lockstep rather than on an individual basis. Uh, there's a lot of issues with programmatic efficiency and cost, new people, MR access. These applicators are really, really expensive um, and programs aren't compensated for them. Um, and I think we need new models of care. I think it raises the really interesting point and a very sensitive point of who should be doing uh, brachytherapy for cervical cancer. Uh, how many patients do you need to have in your program on an annual basis to be able to do this in an ongoing and competent manner? So audience, the last audience participation question, what do you think is the single biggest barrier to implementing MR-guided brachytherapy in your practice environment? If you haven't implemented it, you can actually take a guess. If you have, comment on what was the biggest barrier uh, uh, within your program. And I think most people would agree with that. Um, those are the um, programmatic funding for sure is a, is a big problem. You know, as I said, that cost effectiveness analysis was done from the perspective of the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. Um, what needs to happen now and what we're working at in Ontario is trying to shift some of those resources that um, are allocated for the treatment of recurrence and toxicity earlier in the course of this disease so that they're available to the radiation treatment programs uh, up front to try and uh, enable this sort of treatment. But that's a dialogue and discussion that is ongoing. Access to MR imaging remains a barrier in some places, but I fundamentally believe that MR will be a component of every radiation treatment program um, uh, very shortly. And um, the last thing I just, this is one of my fellows gave me this slide, and I just want to come back to where I started and say I think vaccination and early detection is critical and very, very important, but we can't forget about treating patients with established disease. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm fully convinced. Uh, any uh, question in the audience? I guess we're all fully convinced. Perfect. That's what I want. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Rob. Yeah. Make sure. Um, you know, with the interstitials, with that, you know, you still have a device and you're kind of limited. You stick, you know, those things, you, you, know, you place them and then you image, right? Do you re adjust yeah. them? So, how, how do you do that? So, so, yeah, and it's a bit of a fiddly process, but ideally, um, you put those needles in and then you adjust them, um, adapt them. It, to get them in the right place in the right time. And that device, there are other ways of doing it. There are other ways of actually giving more degrees of freedom. But typically, there are four fractions of treatment done. So you actually have a chance to adapt your treatment from fraction to fraction as you go along. So you put them in once, see the imaging, fix it the next day, keep changing it over time to get them exactly where you need them to be.